says it's on. Oh, I hear something now. Oh, here we go. Much better. Okay, uh, I'm Benjamin, Jerry Franz with uh, LinkedIn, a senior uh, SRE with them. And this is my talk on scalability and performance. Said uh, LinkedIn, listen, take it, listen, let, mm. Okay, lessons learned, take it. The second highest QPS Couchbase server at LinkedIn from zero to awesome. It was definitely zero when we started, so let's get started here. Day one, we have a Couchbase cluster. Okay, not a great day to start, but let's go. Said so we meet the Couchbase cluster. We had three parallel clusters of 16 machines, each with 64 gig of RAM, a terabyte of RAID 1 disk, and six buckets on each machine. And it was massively under-resourced. Uh, memory was completely full. Each, each uh, subcluster had a node failed out. Disk utilization was running at 100% all the time. And there was no alerting. Oops. <laughs> OK. Immediate problems. Uh, we couldn't store any new data because the memory was full, and there wasn't even enough disk I.O. to write it out. <laughs> This was aggravated by nodes falling out of the cluster, reducing both the available memory and the amount of disk I.O. available. And there was no visibility into these issues for two reasons. One, we didn't even actually know what a healthy cluster looked like. And B, we didn't actually get any alerts. We found out it was dead because the devs came to us and said, something's not working. <laughs> it's like, oh. So started the first aid. You know, configured alerting, so at least we would know if there was a problem. Started a temporary program of semi-manually monitoring and intervening in the cluster to keep it from falling over dead. So every time it started to fall over, we'd empty the data and start it over and try to keep it alive a few days at a time. And then we doubled the number of nodes in the cluster from uh, 48, 16 in each subcluster, to 32 in each. So we had a total of 96 nodes now, which, you know, should improve things, right? And we uh, increased the disk fragmentation threshold from 30 to 65 percent to reduce the disk I.O. And we reduced metadata expiration time from three days to one day, which really helped keep us from filling the memory up quite so fast. Node failouts, we found out what caused them. It turns out to be a combination of a Linux kernel setting, which people often don't know about, something called Linux Transparent Huge Pages, which basically is an optimization for managing huge memory Linux machines. Uh, unfortunately, it has a very bad downside in a memory-based system like Couchbase, where when it defragments this large chunk of memory, for several minutes it can get very, very slow. And it gets very, very slow, and the cluster says, I don't like your node anymore, and kicks it out. <laughs> The other problem we had was what I call pre-failure hard drives. These are hard drives that, well, in a strict technical sense, were not actually bad. In other words, if you were to go to the manufacturer and say, this drive is bad, they say, no, it's not. It, however, wasn't as healthy as we needed. So it'd be doing things like, oh, I need to recover some data from the disk because it's a bad sector, and it would get slow, and the node would fall out of the cluster. Okay, disk persistence. We remember we were saying we weren't getting everything written to disk. Well, doubling the cluster actually didn't really fix that. Uh, <laughs> you'd think that doubling it would do that, but it didn't. Said uh, we, we improved the app so it wasn't writing as much data. Uh, we tuned all the resources things for disk I.O. And in spite of all that, we were still running basically 100% I.O. 724, which tends to make the system unhappy. It turned out the cluster had a huge amount of what I call hidden I.O. We were writing data with TTLs varying from five minutes to 24 hours, but because we couldn't actually keep up with it, a great deal of it was expiring in queue before it could ever make it to the disk. So as a result, there's a huge amount of I.O. that anytime you added more I.O. capability, it just ate. So we doubled the capacity, and it wrote twice as much, and it still wasn't up to writing everything. We were still taking about a day between the time things got submitted to the server to the time they reached the disk. So, yes, we were going faster. No, it wasn't actually solving our problem yet. 
We solved the, the health problem visibility because we started getting uh, alerts sent to us, and then we also identified what we considered to be the most important uh, metrics that really are most useful, because we have about 265 metrics we're monitoring, and not all of them are immediately useful in terms of looking at it and saying, oh, my cluster is healthy. Came down to about three of them that really mattered to us. Uh, EP disk queue items, which is just basically, you know, how many items are waiting to go to the disk? Uh, if you can't keep up and that keeps growing, sooner or later you're gonna have a very bad day. EP storage age, which is basically the age of the last thing written to the disk. On a healthy cluster, that should be about maybe one second on average or less. On our cluster, when we started, it was 24 hours pretty close. So, and then how much memory, how, how much of our stuff is memory resident? In our use case, we try to keep everything 100% memory resident. Although we're fully disbacked, everything is also cached in memory, and if we're not doing that, we're not performing. So, overall status update after our first round. Uh, still on fire. So, servers, lots of servers. My best estimate was that to meet our I.O. demand, I'd have to double the size of the cluster again. We'd already gone from 48 to 96. I figured we'd need to go to 192 before we'd actually be up to our speed. So, this is getting somewhat expensive and a little silly, maybe. Okay, trying to change up strategies. SSDs, remember I said we were running on, on spinning disks, a pair of RAID 1 guys, and so we kind of said, you know, maybe that's not the right disk for this problem. So we got a pair of 560 Virodent SSDs, which are actually ESSI, they're cards that you stick in, not, not, a, not a SATA card or a SATA or SAS bus, but actually PCI E card that you stick in the machine. They're very fast. And to test it under increased flow, we dropped the size of the cluster again, back down from 32 to, to 16 per uh, uh, the subcluster. And the right I.O. and the SSDs immediately went nuts. It was running about, oh, five to 10 times as much on the SSDs as it was on the hard drives. Uh, so, so we just started doing the performance testing and scaling. Uh, and while the disks were keeping up just great, we had a problem, and that is SSDs are only rated for so many writes. They're rated at about three times their total size per day. We were writing about, oh, 10 times their size per day. And they were burning out. Our best estimate is in about 50 weeks, we'd have to replace them because they would have died. They were fast enough, but they couldn't take the load over the long haul. So, a little tuning on the SSD strategy. We got bigger ones, which doesn't sound like the right, sounds a little strange, but it makes sense when you think about the problem is how many total writes of the disk. If I can do three total writes on a 550, and that's healthy, three total writes on a 2.2 tera is much better. I have a lot more room to run before I run into the wall. And then we actually reduced the size of the cluster again. We actually took it down to eight nodes for each of the, each of the three groups. And here was what our end results were from all these little tweaks so far. In the red is what we were doing when we started. The big bowls were kind of, the big, see the spots were kind of drops there, and kind of low in the red area, little dropouts. That was what it was doing when I first ran into it, when it was dying. The 32 nodes, you can see, yeah, we're doing a lot better. We're writing twice as much traffic. But when you get to the SSDs, you can see we're doing even much better. We actually more than doubled the traffic we were doing with the SSD, with the 32, on only eight nodes. So for the first time since we brought it up, we were actually writing all of our data to disk. <laughs> so, so at that point, we decided we're going to convert all the clusters. And are we done? Not quite. Starting up to 11. We were not completely on fire anymore. We weren't awesome yet. We were still taking up to 40 minutes to persist data to disk. So. Someone would write something to our database, and about three quarters of an hour later, it would make it to the disk. This wasn't the drives problem. It was the application and the machine. It wasn't keeping up with the drives. We had converted from an I.O. limited problem to a CPU limited problem. So, time to go a little faster. We 
We took the number of reader writer threads from the default three to eight, which immediately slashed our time to read things to the disk. You can see at the start we were running, oh, a good chunk of a half hour or so to get things to disk. This is one, each of the three clusters, and as you kick them each in with these three write threads, you can see it drops down to the bottom. On this scale, it is actually less than one pixel high at the end. We took the number of buckets on the machine and slashed them. It turns out that the more buckets you have, the worse your disk I.O. is on these things, tremendously so. By just shifting down from four to two buckets, we improved our I.O. footprint by 30 to 40 percent with no other changes. And the database normally vacuums deletions about once an hour, that's the default setting, and that causes some spikes when you're moving data the way we are, because once an hour you suddenly have to remove, say, 100 million records from the system, and performance suffers when you do that. So we kicked it down to every 10 minutes, and so instead of having spikes going up to, oh, five or six milliseconds at our 99th percentile, we smoothed out and everything was just running almost the same as it just day-to-day -day traffic, a hardly noticeable change when things got vacuumed. And now, buckle your seatbelt. This is what we're, our overall load is. We run 75% writes. We run 13 byte values of about 25 byte keys, so very small individual records, with 2.5 billion items plus a replica. This uses 600 gigabytes of RAM, three terabytes of disk, and our average store latency is 0.4 millisecond from the app. 99th percent latency, 2.5 milliseconds. Average get latency, 0.8 milliseconds, and 99th percent get latency, eight milliseconds. So we're cooking along here. I've kind of renamed our, our big clusters here. You may recognize the names. Sneezy is this particular cluster. And this is, remember I said how long, the max storage age, how long to get things to the disk? You can see Sneezy is averaging now 1.1 seconds to get things to the disk with a worst case of about three, down from about a day. We are doing a peak traffic of just under 700,000 QPS. And remember, this is at 75% writes, with an average of just under 400,000 QPS. And we're writing a little bit to the disk. We are writing five and a half gigabytes a second peak, and over three gigabytes a second sustained. And remember, this is across 24 machines. So these guys are seriously cooking along. And that's actually the end of the straight presentation, and now it's open for questions. So if people have any questions about how, how why, and what here. Okay, these are all local disks. The original disks were, the question was, are these local or network disks? They're, they're, they're all local disks. Originally, they were one terabyte drives in RAID 1s, uh, and they were spinning disks. And then we switched to SSDs, actually ESSDs, again locally. Okay, now a couch-based uh, cluster can have multiple buckets. In our case, we had six buckets on the node handling various things. Uh, somebody had had the misimpression that more buckets would handle things better. It was actually kind of backwards. It turns out less buckets handle things better. Uh, but on these machines, when you're going very, very fast, the more buckets you have, the worse your performance gets. Because, for example, disk I.O., you have, remember, you have 1,024 V buckets if you've been paying attention to some of these lectures. So with eight machines, 1,024 V buckets, you have like 128 V buckets on a machine. And even though it is a log format database, it still has to switch between all these files. So if you have one, you have 128. If you have six, you have 1,024, plus replicas, which raise it to maybe 2,000 files you're writing on this disk. And all of a sudden, if, particularly if you're using a spinning disk, you're having real trouble just moving the disk head around enough to keep up with what you're doing. Yes, my, but my question is more like, uh, match by your position to reduce the bandwidth. So how do you do that? 
Okay, in our case, we have a map that says, okay, this bucket, this virtual name that we use in our application is mapped to this physical bucket. And so what I did was I changed that map to say all three of these buckets all point to the same physical bucket. So the, app, the only change that was made in the app was a configuration change. Basically said, okay, instead of distributing across three physical buckets, we'll put it in one physical bucket. Okay, these are uh, Cisco C220s. They have 64 gig of RAM, 24 cores of processor, uh, two hard drives, which are, are paired uh, one terabyte hard drives, just pretty much standard ones, nothing, so super, there's like 7200 RPM uh, standard web app nodes. Okay, uh, more questions? No, actually we did. We have had node failures, we ha or, or other reasons that, that took a node out, and no, we have not had any data failure, any data loss as a consequence of that. We actually do have enough headroom to uh, manage that, and in fact, at LinkedIn, we actually do deliberate failouts between fabrics, and so we actually deliberately increase the load about 30 or 40 percent about once a week to prove that we can handle it. <laughs> so, so even with a node failed out and in a failover scenario with an extra 30 percent of traffic in this configuration, we can deal with it. So not, not since we got this set up. Before we had this set up, yeah, there was, uh, there was loss because we were filling up the memory. So it reached the point where literally there was no place for it to put anything. So this is 2.20, cache base 2.20. So we are actually looking forward quite a bit to, to, to Okay, the question was, what version of Couchbase are we using? And that, that we're using Couchbase 2.20. We're actually looking forward to, to, to the uh, 4.0, because we, we anticipate the Forest DB will greatly improve our disk I.O. So, so any, any, any more questions? My current what is? The kernel bottleneck? Uh, I'm suspecting we're running at low on CPU. We're running about 29 to 30% of CPU right now. Uh, we also have, still have more buckets than I would like. So if we were, to, we're plan, actually planning on, on taking our current four or five, uh, we have one more high capacity bucket that I'm gonna merge in. And I expect to get another 20% IO off that. Uh, but right now we're not running into the wall. So it's a little hard to guess where our next bottleneck is. Right, all, all the buckets are distributed across the same drives. They're not separated. The, this particular one is used by two applications. They're very closely related. And basically what they do is they count things. So they count events, uh, about two and a half billion of them a day. I can't hear you. So you have very similar Right. One application is actually a, a replacement for the first application. It's actually a second generation of the first application. Say that again. Why are you still migrating to a 4.0? 4.0? Uh, well, a, a 4.0 just barely baited today. Uh, <laughs> that's probably going to slow us down a little bit. Uh, and, you know, it, we tend to be a little conservative. We actually have a process where of, of check things out before we leap into them. Uh, and so 4.0 is going to be under investigation for us here in the very near future now that it's in beta. But it had, wasn't out, and 3.0 didn't have the Forest DB, which was the big thing that we were looking for. I was looking for at least for my database. The average document size is about 13 bytes. The high watermark for the cluster in terms of uh, total memory usage or in terms of, oh, the largest documents. The largest documents are probably 40 to 50 bytes. So most of them are counters, which are only 13 bytes. That's just the minimum size. This is production. This is actually what we're running in live world. This is not a test setup. This is actually what we're running. 
Uh, basically, it's, it's counters. We, we monitor things for uh, security, basically. People hitting the LinkedIn site, you know, we have to monitor what people are doing so we can proactively find people who are doing bad things. And so we have to collect a lot of counters saying, oh, people looked at this, oh, they looked at that. And so we're basically counting a lot of different things. Like, oh, this IP address hit 4,000 things in two seconds. Maybe they aren't a good person. <laughs> so. The first things I would do, A, uh, one bucket. That's probably the very first thing, because we, we, we splintered our I.O. badly by having multiple buckets, and that immediately uh, made our whole situation much worse. Uh, second thing, I'd go to SSDs immediately, uh, because what, what we, should, we should have done was a better job of estimating what our real load was. Uh, when I, got, I came on board, this cluster was already in existence, so I, I was actually not involved in the original estimation. But I do know that when this cluster was first onboarded, it had eight machines running hard drives, which total 24 across all three fabrics. And given that I figured we needed 192 of them that way to actually make it work, it may not have actually been estimated correctly as to how big the load was. <laughs> so. Do you have any XDR or what do you do for No, we aren't doing any XDCR with this. The data is extremely volatile. Uh, we actually turn over every 24 hours. So even if we were to lose all this data, at worst, we would fill it up again in a day. Well, two things. Uh, one is I'm working on getting the I.O. load down by doing things like merging buckets, because that will reduce I.O. load. Uh, looking forward to Forest DB, because that should reduce I.O. load again. Uh, bigger SSDs were a chunk of it because they just simply have longer wear life. Our current estimate is that these SSDs will last about 180 weeks, which was a lot better than the 50 weeks of the, of the first round. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, more questions? Are we covered it? Ah, one more. How many app servers do you have connected? Oh, that's a good one. So this actually has 32 in each fabric. So there's actually 32 machines connecting to the eight machines in each, each of the three groups. So there's a total of 96 machines to connecting to the total of 24 machines. So I think we may have hit the end of it, since everyone's I think, has got their questions. And thank you for what was hopefully an enjoyable, although somewhat brief, uh, talk. Uh, thank you. Good. Quick question. Is there a way you can see how the life of the SSD, how much left? Yes, there is. 